Today we're hosting the 2018 Health Summit, Engaging Communities for a Healthier Louisiana. And we have people here from all over the state of Louisiana who come together to solve serious problems as it relates to health care and health overall. Louisiana continues to struggle with poor health outcomes, um, disparities in many areas, chronic diseases, birth outcomes, uh, economic uh, security in terms of poverty. So there are a lot of issues that we're, we're focusing on. We're also talking here today about the looming uh, threats to health care funding because of what's going on in our state with regards to state revenues and the fiscal cliff that we're um, facing if the legislature does not act soon to raise revenue uh, to avoid the serious cuts to health care. We know that whenever there are cuts um, to the state budget that though many of those cuts end up coming to health care, education, and other infrastructure services. And so we're talking about a lot of serious issues. We're talking about behavioral health, mental health services, and how to uh, facilitate and assist individuals to uh, live in the most integrated uh, settings. We're also talking about you know children and families and how to assist children and families to deal with uh, many of the trauma traumas that they have experienced over these past years. So there's a lot going on at this summit and we're just really excited. Governor John Bell Edwards opened the summit this morning. He gave us a lot of updates about the um, progress that we've made, that his administration has made with regards to health care, with Medicaid expansion, with improving health outcomes, providing more, um, more care to more people, and also shoring up and stabilizing our provider community, our health care providers, our hospitals, our rural hospitals, our rural uh, com health com uh, clinics and so forth. And so just a lot is going on. Senator Regina Barrow was here and talked about more specifically what some of those cuts are and how those cuts are going to be, uh, are going to impact people all across the state. She talked about the need for policies for uh, us as a state to really, really pass policies. And she talked about the fact that the reason why we got here is largely because of some of the policies of this state. And so we're focusing here on bringing together people from all around the state, encouraging them to be involved and engaged, not just today, but when they go back home to work, to continue the work of working together, building partnerships, and collaborating with each other to improve the health outcomes of our communities. And our website is www.lahealthequity.org. They can also visit the Facebook page and probably one of the easiest and fastest ways to get updates and information about the Health Summit is on our Facebook page, which is uh, Louisiana Health Summit. And it's 2018 Louisiana Health Summit. We will post uh, pictures and videos on that website. My latest book is Health Disparities. Um, it's the, the title of the book is kind of long, but it's Health Disparities, Diversity and Inclusion, Context, Controversies and Solutions. So that's my newest book. And I also have two books about cultural competency. One is Cultural Competency and Health Administration, and the other one is Cultural Competency for Health Professionals. So those are my recent books. Why is community mobilization important to address health equity? Without the community, we really can't get anything accomplished. The issues associated with health equity are pertinent to the community, so therefore the community has to be involved. And the motivation is clearly the issues themselves. So for example, food injustice, mass incarceration. And we can go into some more discussion about the topics, but the bottom line is that the community is already motivated. The question is how do we get the community organized to solve problems rather than relying on others? In your opinion, who is the community, who is the community when we talk about mobilization to address these health disparities? Well, when we look at priority populations, we're talking about certain groups of individuals. So I would start with low socioeconomic status individuals. And within the context of that, we have certain groups that are people of color that are impacted more by low socioeconomic status than others. So priority populations are those who are impacted and affected by health disparities and who are experiencing problems in terms of health equity. 
but really it's everyone. Anyone who is having problems with access to care, with discrimination, um, the prison community. I talked about this today in my keynote address. There's so many groups, young people, children, the elderly, and we can go on and on and on, but at the top of the list, I would put low socioeconomic status individuals. As you were aware of some of the health issues in our community, what are some suggestions you may have for us to select a health issue or two that may be addressed that will result in a success for the community, i.e. give a few examples of issues facing the community? Well, basically we have to prioritize. So the list is so long in terms of health disparities, so we can look at specific health issues. But I think we have to prioritize with social injustice because those problems impact the health status of individuals. So before I mention mass incarceration, we have a significant number of individuals that are locked up in prison from communities that are very seriously affected by low socioeconomic status, health disparities, lack of health equity, and all of that. We also have children who are not receiving the kind of quality education that is needed. We look at these topics as peripheral, but they're critical critical because health literacy is the outcome, actually health illiteracy is the outcome of individuals not getting a proper education. So we have to address those kind of issues, social injustice as priorities as we look at the health status of individuals and try to reduce health disparities and strive for health equity. What do you think should be the primary objective when trying to mobilize a community for addressing health equity issues? Speaking with and dealing directly with the community. So for some odd reason, we've come to believe only those individuals who are outside of the community, who are extremely educated, um, we have academics, we have medical professionals, and et cetera. But we're forgetting to talk to the people who are affected the most, the people in the community. So I think that's where we have to begin, because in actuality, they have the answers. I don't have the answers to what is needed in every community, but the community knows, so we have to ask them. Well, I think the best planning tools are already in front of us. We have to look at benchmark programs that have actually worked, and we can replicate those. For example, I talked about a community health center in Miami that was started by a nurse. Her name was Jessie Trice. And from scratch, starting with a trailer all the way to what it is now, today, a huge community health center, we can take a look at what did they do, how did they plan that, how did they organize the community. There's no simple plan. Every community is different with different needs. So we can't come up with a blueprint and say, go and do this here and go and do this there and go and do this. We have to go to the community and ask them, what do you need and what resources do you already have and what are you missing, what are you lacking and how can we help you? And then from that information, we can put together a plan. So there isn't a global plan for all communities that are suffering. We have to go into the community and find out what the needs are and then develop a plan based on that. Will you please tell us about some successful results that you have encountered using community mobilization for health issues? Well, one is I just described, so it's not a personal example. I rather speak of something that I was involved with, and so I go back to the community health center. So I've worked with a couple of community health centers, but I'll use this one as an example. So we had a facility entitled Jefferson Reeves House. This was a place where women from all walks of life were becoming addicted to drugs and they would be mandated to go into a facility to get off drugs and many of these women had children so the question is what can we do for them the answer was to build a facility the first of its kind in miami-dade county which is where i'm from to allow women to come into this facility with their children and get their lives together and then proceed from there so once again we had a problem we took a look at a group of individuals, what do they need, developed a solution. And many of those women, I served as vice president for a while, vice president of behavioral health at that center. And I watched many of those women go from 
being on the street, addicted to drugs, not knowing what to do with their lives and how to get organized and settled, to leaving there and having a successful life with their children. But it took seriously looking at their individual situation and their community situation, putting a plan together, organizing, and then helping them get through their situation. It can be done. So this is a mere example. There's so many successes. And in my book that I mentioned earlier, the book title includes context, controversies, and solutions. So in that book, there's lots of solutions that people can take a look at and try to figure out, does this apply here? Or can we talk to the community about this particular project? What works? But there's no pat, one and done answer. It involves going into the community. I work for the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law in DC, which is a national nonprofit organization. And we uh, focus on uh, advancing the rights of people with mental disabilities. And um, my uh, workshop or panel is about um, community integration of people with disabilities. Um, and primarily people with mental disabilities. And so, you know, that really means not, um, not warehousing people with mental disabilities in institutional settings when they can be served in their own homes and their own communities. Um, Louisiana has, I think, some shortages of, uh, of community mental health services that are critical, like supported housing and uh, mobile crisis teams, assertive community treatment services. And so as a result of that, I think a lot of the Justice Department actually did a findings letter about a year ago, a little bit more than that, actually finding that lots of folks ended up stuck in nursing homes and didn't need to be there and would be better served um, at less cost in their own homes and communities. But you got to develop the services to make that happen. So there are about 250 or so nursing homes around the state that the Justice Department found um, take Medicaid and end up serving people with mental illnesses who often don't need to be there. And so, um, yeah, I think if uh, there's a couple places people can look, um, the Bazelon Center's website actually has a lot of information about the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which has uh, an integration mandate, and that is sort of what the Justice Department was um, investigating um, in Louisiana, was whether it was compliant with the ADA and its integration mandate and so we have a lot of resources about that and what it means um, and what it means for you know different states um, in terms of their service systems um, the Justice Department also has a website the ADA and um, what we often call Olmstead which was a Supreme Court case about the integration mandate that really describes why it's so important to give people with disabilities the opportunity to live independently with choice and autonomy and dignity and um, in their own homes and communities. be speaking about how to build community power so that we could advance health equity and improve health and outcomes and opportunities for disadvantaged communities. Working with people and organizations to advance equity, thinking about equity across the board. So we say oftentimes in the field the social determinants of health, so education, housing, employment, civic engagement, all of these things are connected to health and when you don't have access to those things or when you're experiencing disparities across the social determinants of health, those create disadvantages that are linked to poor health. And so I want people to take away that we are really engaging in a broader movement for equity across all of these different domains of life because we don't get to this larger goal of equity where everyone has a fair opportunity to be healthy if we don't address these underlying structural and systemic issues that have created generations of poverty, of disadvantage, and poor health outcomes. I'm with the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. We're a, a national healthy housing organization, so we sit at sort of the intersection of housing conditions and health. And we've been working for around 30 years in improving uh, the connection points between those two things. And I'm here to talk about our model in which we sort of look at if you improve housing conditions and people get healthier, 
and they start to not go to the hospital, not go to the emergency department, is there a way that we can take those health outcomes and use those to provide additional resources to pay for more housing uh, uh, services? As a featured speaker to talk about uh, how traumatized communities can promote and recover their mental health outcomes. What I would say that people should take away is understanding the resources the community has to offer, specifically um, the solidarity of the community itself. So knowing that um, reestablishing network ties, uh, relying on the social support, family, friends, neighbors, that's uh, a very important resource that can go a long way to improving uh, people's mental health, uh, reducing stress, um, mitigating depression, anxiety, uh, PTSD. So making sure that you have a good support system um, in place and maintaining those contacts. Thank you for joining us at the 2018 Health Summit. Our theme today is Engaging Communities for a Healthier Louisiana. I want to recognize our Health Summit planning team. We have planned this third annual statewide Health Summit to be an informative and impactful day designed to build upon our collaborative efforts from the prior two years health summits as we continue working toward achieving health and becoming a healthier Louisiana. It is our pleasure to serve as your host throughout the day. I would like to acknowledge and thank our presenting sponsor, the Louisiana Department of Health, Office of Public Health, um, and Dr. Jaberry, who's here on the, on the dais. Uh, I would also like to recognize our major sponsors, Healthy Blue, Louisiana Healthcare Connections, Aetna, and Pennington. Thank you to all of our sponsors. They are all listed on the back of the program. This event would not have been possible without you. And in that regard, I would like to recognize and ask um, the, the executive director of Pennington to come up and just say a word or two, and that's Mr. John P. Curran. Mr. Curran? The theme of this particular conference is, uh, is, very, uh, is very important to uh, the state, and it's very important to Pennington, and we're really uh, proud to be able to host you here today, and I wish you well uh, in your discussions today, and hopefully it will lead to um, new initiatives and new programs, new ideas uh, that can move health forward. So thank you, and uh, have a great day. Our goal this year is to develop a framework for the mobilization of communities to address social and economic conditions or gaps that impact the health of Louisiana residents, and we know they are many. The outcomes we are seeking from each of the sessions are geared toward pressing health policy topics facing communities throughout our state. Throughout today's summit, I ask you to stay engaged, to help discover innovative ways to continue working together to improve the health of our communities and of our state overall. We recognize and deeply value you and the experiences and expertise you bring today. It's a great day in Baton Rouge for a number of reasons. Uh, not to mention, first and foremost, when you walked out of your door this morning, hopefully in Baton Rouge, you saw a bright, sunshiny day. But secondly, uh, you're here to hear from experts today about how we can address health equity, behavioral health, and healthy living across our great state. And so I am proud to say that through our Mayor's Healthy City Initiative, that we have all five hospitals in East Baton Rouge Parish who have agreed to spend the next three years focusing on the same priorities that you have here today healthy living, behavioral health, access to care, and HIV. We know that these challenges are not unique to our parish or our state, but are occurring across our nation. That is why we are going to address the underlying social determinants of health. And so in order to address the social determinants of health, we will identify the highest needs by zip codes using data. We will use the Community Needs Index to in examine the income, the culture, education, insurance, and housing in our communities. We recognize that a CNI score of 1.0 indicates a zip code with the least need, 
while a score of 5.0 represents a zip code with the highest, most immediate needs. And in our parish, we have seven zip codes with a score of 4.2 or higher, which represents over 124,000 of our residents. I know that we can't address these challenges alone. And that is why I look forward to partnering with all the leaders in this room today with the Louisiana Center for Health Equity to make Baton Rouge and Louisiana a healthier place for all. In closing, my vision for our great city is that our city will be one of peace, prosperity, and progress. But the truth is, the cornerstone of peace, prosperity, and progress is great health. And so if we don't have a healthy community, we won't have peace, progress, and prosperity. So I thank you all for all that you are doing to add to the fabric of health equity, not only here for our great capital city, but in the state of Louisiana. Have a great conference today. It is hard for me to believe that this is the third time, because I've been governor for two years and two months and a week or something like that. But, uh, but uh, to be here for the third time speaking to you all, uh, you know, it, it's hard for me to believe how fast time passes. But I, I want to thank all of you for what you do, not just for being here today, but what you do every day. Uh, and it is very important for the state of Louisiana. And today I want to talk to you about several things uh, related to health care in Louisiana, particularly give you an update on Medicaid expansion, uh, some of the uh, challenges that we face around health care, especially as it relates to uh, the budget situation that we need to get resolved. But I want to back up just a moment uh, because uh, Alma's introduction, it, it caused me to think about something when I was growing up. You know, my dad was our sheriff in Tangeville Parish. My mother was an emergency room nurse at Lila Kemp Charity Hospital uh, there in Independence. And she would spend a, a good part of her day, uh, because she was an emergency room nurse, um, she would spend a good part of her day taking care of my dad's inmates. Uh, and she would come home at night and, she, you know, we would have supper. And I don't know how she did it, because she would come home and she would cook these wonderful meals for all eight of her children. Um, good Catholic family, eight kids in 10 years. Uh, but, uh, but she would tell us about her day and how important it was that she was able to provide health care, how rewarding that was for her. Um, and, and particularly, she would let us know if she was taking care of inmates in the parish jail. Uh, and so she set a tremendous example for me and my siblings about the importance of health care uh, and, and how we ought to do better. Uh, and if you think about the context of what she was talking about, um, she was talking about inmates. And when I became governor, we weren't even making a serious effort to provide health care to working poor people who had never broken a law in their lives. And, and look, that's not to say we shouldn't be taking care of inmates because we should. They're human beings and they're brothers and sisters in Christ. We were just reminded uh, in prayer a while ago about the things we should be about. By the way, today's been a beautiful day, and the mayor mentioned it, but I actually got up, and, and I always do. I prayed with my wife, then I went to a prayer breakfast, and then I just had that prayer. So it's 9, it's 915, and I've, I've prayed three times already this morning. But I just wanted to, to share that with you because that is what inspired me uh, when I became governor, to, and really before that, as, as a legislator just to know that the Medicaid expansion is the right thing to do. And, and, and look, uh, not everybody agrees with me on everything. And by the way, that's okay. That, it would be a boring world if we all agreed on everything all the time. Um, but the same faith uh, that leads me to be pro-life tells me that the Medicaid expansion is pro-life. Uh, because being pro-life isn't all about the unborn. And in fact, when a child is born, that is, that is, you know, equally important, if not more important, and all the way through. So I, I just believe in, in what we're doing here in Louisiana, but there are challenges, and the challenges some are here in our state, and some of them come from Washington, D.C. 
But I said at the time that I signed the executive order on January the 12th of 2016 that expanding Medicaid would be the easiest big decision that I would ever make. Well, two years, two months, and a week later, I can tell you, it is the easiest big decision that I have made as governor. And it is paying off for the state of Louisiana. Um, health insurance, nearly 470,000 working poor in Louisiana have health insurance today who didn't have it before we expanded Medicaid. Many of them for the first time in their lives. And that presents special challenges because a lot of these folks, they have a lot of demand right now for health care in the first two or three years of enrollment because they were underserved for so long and their health conditions were not in check and, and they, they were not as healthy as we would want them to be. And we expect that at some point in the near future that that's going to level off. Uh, and we want it to, not just because it will be less costly to the state, but that means that we are producing better health outcomes. And, and so that's incredibly important. The other thing is people who've never had health insurance, they don't really have familiarity with how to access health care. They, they typically went to the emergency room, and who can blame them? That was the one place they knew they could go, and they wouldn't be turned away. Um, you know, if, if you have a, a, a child who is sick at night or and, and you can't comfort them, and you are going to bring them to an emergency room, right? So, so it takes a little bit of time to make sure people understand the best way to access care, and we're going through that. Uh, right now, and and so you have you have all of these particular challenges, especially up front. But but in the time that we have enrolled 470,000 people, I want you to know, 75% of those people had a primary care visit with a doctor in the last 12 months. Now that that would not have happened before uh, Medicaid expansion for those individuals, um, and. This is where we really start getting into some of the, the, uh, the, the pro-life things that I was talking about. Breast cancer. We've had 35,700 women screen for breast cancer because they had uh, coverage through Medicaid. Um, and sadly, 338 of those individuals were diagnosed with breast cancer. But at least they know they've got it. And, and many of them, probably most of them, Maybe all of them were diagnosed earlier in that disease stage than would have otherwise been the case. And so the, the treatment will be more effective. It will be less costly. Their quality of life will be higher. They can stay in the workplace longer. All of those sorts of things uh, can happen now. Uh, with respect to colon cancer, similar, 21,000 screening, 6,600 individuals have had precancerous polyps removed. We know that those precancerous polyps will cause cancer later in life. Uh, and so those are literally cancers avoided in those individuals. 285 were diagnosed with full onset of colon cancer. Uh, same situation with the breast cancer. At least they know they have it now and they can access treatment. Diabetes, 6,900 diagnosed and being treated. Hypertension, 17,800. Uh, diagnosed and being treated. By the way, you can see the importance of what Pennington uh, is doing here, trying to figure out how we do better and stay healthier uh, in terms of the way we live, how we exercise, what we eat, what our habits are, and so forth. Uh, I didn't really have the, the, these numbers last year to share with you, but, but I'll update you on, on a couple of other areas. Mental health, 58,000 individuals on Medicaid expansion have accessed outpatient or inpatient treatment for mental health problems. Uh, 18,000 outpatient and inpatient uh, for substance use issues. Those are incredibly important numbers and they, they verify what we're all trying to do and that is make access to quality health care more available to individuals so that they can have a higher quality of life literally so that many of these people can just live. You know, it, you, don't, you don't live without access uh, to health care. Um, so people are getting, more people at least, are getting the help that they need. Um, and if you saw 
the uh, opening of the regular session last week, you will have noticed that, that one of my guests was a woman who, in a, just a couple of weeks, will have reached a, her one-year milestone of sobriety because of treatment that she was able to get through the Medicaid expansion that helped her kick her opioid uh, issue, which, by the way, is a tremendous issue in this country and in Louisiana, uh, and we all need to be paying attention uh, to that particular crisis. So Medi Medicaid expansion is saving lives. That's a fact. Um, and, and I'm going to talk later about the, the budget issues we're having. You should know that the Medicaid expansion is actually saving money for the state of Louisiana. Uh, this year alone, more than $300 million state general fund will be saved because we expanded Medicaid. And it really isn't that hard to understand how this works. Just do the math with me for just a moment. If someone is uninsured, we pay 40% of the care, and that comes from the general fund. If someone is on Medicaid expansion, we, take, we pay 10% of the cost of that, and that money comes from statutory dedications because we increased provider fees and premium tax uh, uh, on the MCOs uh, that actually administer the Medicaid program to, to meet that full 10% uh, cost share. So I would much rather pay 10% of someone's health care up front and get them access to primary care and all of these, uh, uh, all this access that I just talked about, then only paying for it uh, at 40 cents on the dollar when they go to the emergency room. The emergency room is the most costly, least effective way to manage someone's health. You cannot manage someone's disease in the, the emergency room, but you will pay out the nose for it. So we are doing things in a smart way in Louisiana, I have no doubt. Uh, the vast majority of people across the state of Louisiana support Medicaid expansion. We know that. Now, you're going to see some people trying to chip away at the support that we have by, by uh, making various arguments, uh, none of which really hold uh, water. So, so we know we're doing uh, the right things. One of the things I talked about is that Medicaid expansion is not enough. It's a great starting point, uh, but it is not the finish line, which, we have to, which is why we're going to have to build on the success for access uh, in many ways. And what you need to know is when I hired Dr. Gee, and I don't think uh, Rebecca has joined us yet. Hopefully you'll see her today. By the way, she, she's doing a great job under difficult circumstances here in Louisiana. But what I told her, I said, you know, I want to expand Medicaid. I want more people to have access to health insurance and, and, and have access to the care that that brings. Um, I want to reduce our uninsured rate, which, by the way, went from right at 25% of the state of Louisiana. We think it's somewhere down around 8 or 9% today. That We'll get another survey uh, later this year. I said, but all of that uh, will not be what we want it to be if, at the end of the day, we're not improving health outcomes. We want healthier people in Louisiana. And, and we know, we, we, we know what kind of challenges we face. That's why you're all here. Uh, too often, the lists come out, and, and whether it's education, health care, crime, you name it, we, we, we're too high on the, on the bad list and too low on the good list. But we are making progress, but, but we have some additional work to do. And one of those is with respect to health outcomes for moms and babies. We're just not doing as well as we should be doing. And, and you can't wait till the lady gets to the hospital to deliver to, to try to influence how healthy that baby is going to be and what that delivery is going to be like. Uh, and so, and we know that, uh, but we have to do better. We've consistently ranked among the worst states in the nation for maternal mortality, and that is unacceptable. So I've tasked LDH and Dr. Gee with examining the factors that contribute to maternal mortality and develop recommendations that we can implement in order to turn the corner on this disturbing trend. Uh, that advisory council will be called Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies. Uh, additionally, as we continue to seek new ways to tackle the impacts of the opioid epidemic in communities around Louisiana, it's Im important, I think, especially that we shed light on the problem of neonatal opioid, opiate withdrawal syndrome. I talk to doctors all the time, and the numbers, the trend lines on this are very, very disturbing. Uh, and it is a tremendous strain on the Department of Children and Family Services. 
And in almost every case, they have need to remove that baby from the care of that mother uh, because of, of this particular issue. And so we have to do what we can to, to uh, eradicate that. Representative Walt Leger is going to present House Bill 658 to establish a neonatal opiate withdrawal syndrome. I said it better the second time. Uh, <laughs> pilot program within the Department of Health to treat infants with the syndrome and safe alternatives uh, to intensive care units. You know, intensive care is very, very expensive. Uh, and if we, if we can develop a safe alternative to that, uh, I think uh, we would be doing well. Uh, finally, we have to uh, recreate the Louisiana Commission on HIV, AIDS, and Hepatitis. Uh, Representative Pat Smith is going to advance House Bill 535 to do that so we can continue to reduce the rate of infections and help those who are infected live healthy, productive lives. So those are just a few of the things that, that we are uh, working on in this session. I want to talk a little bit about the fiscal cliff, but before I do, because we're talking about health, recently... I was able to go up to Tensaw Parish uh, and the town of St. Joe, which you may have heard about over the last couple of years. We actually had a public health emergency, a state of emergency that I declared up there around the water system. Uh, there was way too much iron in the water. There was lead in the water. Uh, it, was a, it was a real issue. And we spent about $9 million in less than two years to get three new wells online, a water treatment facility, a new distribution system and water meters at all, all of those homes. And so they now, they now have clean, healthy, pure uh, drinking water. Uh, now, that's a tremendous success story for St. Joe. But we can't spend $9 million in every community around the state of Louisiana. We, we just can't do it. We don't have it. Um, so we're looking for new and innovative ways to make sure that water systems never get to the point uh, that St. Joe's got to uh, and required all of that uh, investment in order to turn it around. You know, something else I, I want to ask you all to be involved in, and this is a little controversial for some and not, not for me, uh, but we are one of the few states in the nation that don't survey our students in our schools on risky uh, sexual behavior. Uh, so, so there is a survey that, that we administer, uh, but, but that part of it is deleted from the survey. And I want you to know the survey is completely anonymous. No student can be or will ever be identified. Uh, Parents have the ability to opt their children out of the survey altogether if they want to. But we are not collecting information about the behavior that our kids are engaging in. Other states do it, and, and I'm not just talking about Massachusetts and California, I'm talking about Mississippi and Texas and, and, our, and our neighbors, and they, they collect the information and then they can figure out, okay, these are the behaviors that are causing what we are seeing these trends, whether it's HIV or AIDS or STDs or teen pregnancy, you, you name it, these are the behaviors, and then we can develop strategies to combat those. But if we just put our head in the sand, we are not doing anybody any good. Uh, and so I am going to be making an effort this year uh, to have that uh, survey expanded in our school system so that we will know more. And I'm just going to ask you to watch when that bill comes before the legislature and go there and, and press the case for doing this. We owe it to our children to help them and we are not helping them. And the opponents of doing this, they, they are, uh, I, I believe they, they have the best of intentions. I just think that they're wrong. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being charitable. I'm, uh, no, I really do. They are, they are good people. Um, they genuinely believe if you ask someone what they're doing, you're encouraging them to do whatever it is they're already doing. I, I, don't, I don't quite understand it, but, but that's what their concerns are. But we have to do better. Uh, and so I'm going to ask you all, because you're here, you're worried about health, uh, you're worried about our children, you're worried about all of our people, 
to use that as an opportunity to go to the legislature and press them to simply do what other states are doing, our neighbors are doing, so that we can get the data that we need to form better strategies. You know, um, you know, if 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 someone is is, well, never mind. I'll 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 stop. <laughs> I'll stop there on that topic. Um, look, I, I do I do want to um, uh, talk about a, a few other things. Uh, the opioid prescriptions continue to steadily decline. Uh, which is very important because 60% of all people who are using heroin and fentanyl today and carfentanil, they started with uh, prescription drugs uh, and, and for some chronic pain condition or something like that. Um, we, we know that people were getting 30-day prescriptions of opioids for a wisdom tooth extraction, for example. Um, and and we, we've got to cut back on that, and, and we are, we're doing a good job. Um, Certainly, we, it's not mission accomplished. The uninsured rate continues to decline. I told you a while ago, I think we went from right at 25% of our population down. The next time we, we get that number, I think it's going to be around the 9% number. Uh, the healthcare industry is booming. You know, if you're going to, if you're going to uh, allow 470,000 more people access to healthcare, you also have to have the people to deliver the healthcare. And not just the doctors and the nurses, although they're incredibly important, but you've got to have people who are uh, taking care of the facilities and the records and everything else uh, that it takes to deliver health care. Um, we are one of the few states in the country, but especially in the South, that hasn't seen rural hospital closures over the last few years. If you take a map of the United States and you overlay that map with rural hospital closures, and then you overlay that map with Medicaid expansion states, you see a very, very close correlation. Uh, and that is because they are delivering less unreimbursed care. Uh, and it, it, it's not, again, a simple math. If you're given less free care, then, then your bottom line is better. You can actually keep your doors open because you close the doors to a hospital and it isn't just the uninsured and the Medicaid people who don't get health care. It's everybody who doesn't get health care. Uh, and so it's important that, that, we, that we continue this. You know, one of the things that I find most discouraging right now uh, in our country is that Congress can't do things that they all agree on. You know, the CHIP program was supposed to be absolutely non-controversial. The, the funding expired last September, and they just got around recently uh, to extending the funding for CHIP. You know, so we, we all had to fight and, and make sure that Congress was paying attention. And, and what they did is they tried, they just were waiting to use it at the most opportune time as leverage, negotiating leverage to throw that in, in in order to get votes for something that people didn't want. And they were willing to allow this program to lapse and go unfunded for month after month after month after month. That is not serving us well. Uh, I mean... By definition, that is the health care of our children uh, that we're talking about. Uh, and, and then you also saw funding uh, threatened for our federally qualified health centers, which are so critically important uh, to us in Louisiana. And we actually had to get involved in that here as well. Now, we have our own funding issues uh, around the fiscal cliff. And, and look, this, this can be difficult to understand, and you see all these numbers, and so I kind of want to make it simple what this fiscal cliff is. Unlike problems we've had over the last several years in Louisiana, the fiscal cliff is not with us because revenue is coming in below our forecast. Expenditures are not coming in higher than we anticipated. But two years ago at this time when we were fighting to stabilize our budget in, in the face of a $2 billion state general fund shortfall, which is what I inherited, we raised revenue we made cuts and we achieved savings. And by the way, the savings principally around the Medicaid expansion, like I just told you. But the revenue that we raised, uh, almost all of it was short term and the legislature decided to sunset that revenue at 27 months. The 27 months expires on June 30th. That is the cliff. The revenue that expires is $1.38 billion. Because of the cuts, because of the 
savings and because of economic growth, I believe that we need to keep $994 million of that in order to adequately fund our critical priorities. So what does that look like to you? If $1.38 billion falls off the table, but we can keep $994 and adequately fund, that is a f almost $400 million net reduction of the tax burden of the people of Louisiana. When is the last time somebody told you John Bell Edwards was willing to allow almost $400 million in revenue to go away? That's not the story that they tell you, but that, that's the case. And by the way, even at that level, at $994 million, there will be some cuts but they won't be as wide, they won't be as deep, we think we can manage. And the $994 million, I didn't just make that up, that is the difference in the general fund for the current fiscal year, as recognized by the REC, and the general fund dollars that we expect next fiscal year, as recognized by the REC. And so I just wanna do the same next year as we did this year, and we will be okay. Um, but this is, this is why I'm sharing this information with you. We had a fiscal session last year, the last fiscal session before the fiscal cliff, not a single bill came out of the House of Representatives to address the fiscal cliff. We just concluded a special session, not a single bill to address the fiscal cliff came out of the House of Representatives and went to the Senate. Now we're in a regular session that doesn't allow us to take up fiscal matters. And so if we're gonna fix this cliff, it'll be in a second special session this year, immediately after this session ends. I have asked the speaker and the president to end this session early so that we can spend more time, effort, and attention on fixing the cliff and we can get it done earlier. We don't wanna be at the end of June trying to figure out what the agency's budgets are gonna be and how we're gonna fund our partner hospitals and our Medicaid services and everything else we do as a state when the new fiscal year starts on July 1st. And by the way, our kids who are on TOPS need to know it. Uh, the parents of kids who are on TOPS need to know it. So, so that's what we're working on. But why is it particularly important to this audience? Because of what you probably already know. We have $9.4 billion in state general fund. If we don't fix the cliff, it goes to $8.4 billion in general fund. But where those cuts have to come from is a slice of the budget that is $3.4 billion big, and the only two big pots of money in that part of our budget are healthcare and higher ed. That is why you see an executive budget proposal for me that I made in January that contains really nasty cuts to healthcare, not because I wanted to do it, but because the Constitution tells me I have to give them a balanced budget. It has to be based on the general fund that is currently forecasted. We lose a billion dollars. That billion dollars has to be cut from 3.4 billion dollars, slice of the budget. So it didn't represent a budget proposal that I want to see implemented. I told the state and the legislature at the time, I've made that comment uh, multiple times since then, and I think it's critically important that we fix the cliff. We do so in a way that doesn't just set us up for another cliff two or three years down the road. It needs to be permanent. <coughs> we shouldn't create any new dedications. And we ought to do something that's, that's fairer for our, our citizens that provides for stability and predictability. We can get it done. There is just too much posturing going on uh, in Baton Rouge right now in the legislature. But I think what you're gonna see is an inability of the legislature to actually pass a budget without fixing the cliff first. That's what we're about to see. And because let me tell you, I cannot imagine that they can fashion a budget that adequately funds what everyone in this room and the vast majority of people around the state of Louisiana believe to be our critical priorities if we don't fix the cliff first. Uh, and so this is going to play out over the next couple of months, but I want you to be part of that. I want you talking to your state representative. I want you talking to your state senator. Uh, make sure you understand what that nursing home down the road is facing. Make sure you know what that rural hospital is facing and our partner hospitals. Uh, it is not pretty. Uh, and it is very real. Pe people just assume that it won't happen. Well, I pray it won't happen. I don't think it will happen. But if we don't fix the cliff, these things will happen. 
uh, I know that. And, and so um, I'm determined to do everything that I can to work with the leadership in the legislature, uh, Republican, Democrat, Independent, it doesn't matter to me, rank and file members, because we have to come together and we have to fix this problem. We can never become what we see in Washington today. We can never do that. The problem there is everybody talks and nobody listens. And when people appear to be listening, they're just waiting for the next opportunity to talk. <laughs> We've got to do better than that here. And, and I'm committed to doing it with your help, uh, with your prayers. We're going to get it done. And we're going to continue to improve health care uh, in Louisiana, especially as it relates to the outcomes. You all are central to that. That's why I appreciate you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. And y'all, please feel free to call on me as we move forward and there are things that you want to bring to my attention or to someone uh, in the administration. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and go back to that building and see if we can get some good work done today on behalf of the state of Louisiana. Thank you very much and God bless. Our next speaker is the uh, Honorable Senator Regina Barrow, who is no stranger to us. Uh, Regina Barrow serves as the chair of the Select Committee on Women and Children in the Louisiana State Legislature. I'm not going to read all of her credentials, but I'm, I'm going to say that she has definitely been a strong advocate and continues to be a strong advocate also for health care and health issues and also for women and children and families. So with that, welcome Senator Barrow. I serve on a lot of committees. I stay busy. It's a lot going on, but I, let me tell you, I love what I do. I love serving people. I love being able to help people, and I love being able to set policies. And so you guys being here today let me know that you're ready to change those policies. Quality of health issues, quality of life issues, where the rubber meets the road. And when you have a legislator who believes that, that this is fictitious or we're just uh, crying wolf, then that's problematic. Ultimately, we have to work together. When I saw a poll this weekend saying that 70% of the citizens feel like the legislature does not care about the people that they represent, that really troubled me. And I believe that we have to, and, I, and I'm hoping that we can, and I'm, I know I'm doing my role to make sure that I'm a consensus builder, that I reach across the party line, that I try, I seek to understand so I can know how to help navigate these waters, but we cannot become like Washington. That is my actual, that's my actual prayer every day because Washington to me has become so dysfunctional that it really makes you wonder why do they even exist? I'm trying to make sure as a legislator that I do my role to ensure that I do seek to be, I seek to understand before being understood so that we can, at the end of the day, reach that place where the people actually win, and not us. I mean, it's all about, for me, it's all about making sure we serve the people. So I want to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is um, going to be talking about the impacts of changing health care funding and delivery. He is Dr. Jaberi uh, Parham. Why do we dedicate so much time, so much money, and so much personnel? Well, it's very very important to the public health, Office of Public Health, as well as those engaged. And I want you all to think about this as you go through today. This is the point of, of the main point of the presentation. When we think about where can we get the biggest bang for our buck in healthcare? What do we need to impact in order to really be able to serve the most number of people and really do the greatest good for the greatest number of folks? Discussion of targeting social and economic policies affecting health. What we're trying to do in the first place is to prevent the risk factors so you're not exposed, so you're able to eat healthy, so you're able to access good food, so you're able to exercise safely in your community. And of course, this term eventually came around again, cardiovascular health, where we saw that clear linkage that if we want people to not have cardiovascular disease, and by the way, as you know, cardiovascular disease is still the number one cause of preventable death, it's not just about getting the right treatment. It's not just about screening. It starts way earlier in life. It starts in your adolescent years, making sure that people develop good life habits, eating healthy, exercising, not smoking. Those risk factors have a lot to do with where we live. 
So the de one definition was actions and measures that inhibit the emergence and establishment of environmental, economic, social, and behavioral conditions, cultural patterns of living known to increase the risk of disease. We've also been att attributing a lot of this to what we call now social determinants of health. What we've come to realize in public health is it's not just about access to care, it's not just about quality care. If we want to prevent disease and illness and lower our costs, we need to start much further upstream, back into the community where social determinants of health play a big role. A child born into one community versus another only a few miles apart, enjoying much of the same things within the environment, probably being exposed to the same amount of air pollution, um, relatively the same factors that we see in the environment, and yet they're growing up in very different communities. What does that mean? What does that mean for the young child? Does it mean that they may have less access to limited safe parks? Does it mean that they won't have walkable streets or grocery stores or good schools? What does that mean for the future of that individual? What does that mean in, in terms of the future of their education and their ability to prosper as an adult?